Hi, my name is Pedro Santos, as Marco said. I'm the, currently the, the head of the music department here in Esmai. Um, I'm very grateful for, for this occasion to share what we have in store here in, in Portugal. Uh, me and, and Bruno Pereira uh, will be talking mainly about our current offering um, in terms of music, technology, art, and performance. Um, and then we'll, Rui Penha will talk a bit more in depth about the, the subject that you just uh, mentioned. Uh, let me share a, a small presentation that we have prepared for you. Just one moment, please. So we come from Esmai, uh, which is uh, in, in Porto, as was mentioned. This is our school. Um, we have uh, currently uh, many uh, different uh, offers uh, in terms of, of degrees. Uh, I'll be talking just about our music department, but we should mention that uh, Esmai is also uh, um, multidisciplinary uh, school. We also have theater and dance. So I'll, I'll be mentioning just the music department, but obviously, um, as it is supposed, um, there are many uh, similarities and many uh, shared work between our departments. So it's an opportunity to, in, in an artistic practice, to also have a, a theater department and do joint work with them. Uh, I'll be just mentioning just now the, the, the music department, but we should also uh, uh, mention that there's other uh, fields of study in Esmai. So our degrees, we have uh, in terms of cycles on our first cycle, the bachelor in music, but we have uh, several uh, areas of uh, fields of study or, or areas of specialization. Um, instrument and singing, so the, the, the performance oriented uh, course, um, early music and jazz, these three uh, uh, are mainly performance uh, studies. Uh, but we also have the composition uh, variant and the pre production and music technology variant. So in these two last uh, variants of the, of the bachelor, uh, the, um, the level of uh, expertise in terms of building new instruments, thinking about music and technology and the, the relationships that uh, are inherent to, to music uh, performance practice uh, uh, is more in depth than in the, the performance variants. Our wish, um, we are working slowly towards that, is that even in uh, the performance oriented uh, studies, uh, we can have uh, more areas of uh, expertise and research also uh, towards building new instruments, at least be aware of, of the, the technology and the possibilities. Um, it's a work in progress, let's say. Uh, our second cycle consists of a master in performance also, in composition, and also in sound arts and technology. We also have a master in music education. Uh, as was said before, uh, mainly the, the, the composition and sound and arts, sound arts and technology courses uh, have uh, more in-depth uh, contact with music and technology. And we also are building in cooperation, cooperation uh, with Aveiro University uh, a new PhD which is already in effect uh, in artistic creation. So that's, that's also uh, another area where we can have uh, this kind of research. Uh, I, I would like to mention, uh, just for, for, for your information, um, that uh, we have many curricular units in each of these variants where music, technology, creative practice become together and uh, are the main focus. Uh, so all students of the music department, be it performance or composition or sound arts, have uh, at least, at least uh, an introduction to music technology, 
which is broadband, where uh, we want to make sure that they know that every field of study at least exists. And if they are uh, curious enough and interested, they can then uh, go to other curricular units, optional cur curricular units, to uh, uh, immerse themselves uh, in that uh, in that field of study. They also have musical acoustics. The scientific part of our curriculum is very important for us, for all that for them to be uh, aware of uh, how sound uh, acts. Uh, and also re recording practice. So even if they are a performer, uh, they should be aware of the recording practice around them, know how to be in a studio, what the problems are, uh, are and uh, know how to collaborate in that context. Uh, in our composition and arts and sound technology uh, fields of study, obviously the, the curricular units are much broader. Uh, electroacoustic music, music programming, music interaction, contemp contemporary performance practices, uh, also acoustics. We have uh, many curricular units uh, revolving around acoustics. Uh, also, in the in the in the sense of uh, uh, organology, so the building of musical instruments, the principles behind sound vibration and music. Uh, uh, so uh, our our school is very much uh, well equipped in terms of curricular units uh, that uh, somehow uh, share this this triangle between sound, art, and technology. Uh, Bruno, I don't know if you want to uh, say something about, uh, in particular, the the. The master in, in which you are the current director. Yeah, well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Well, the, the master in uh, sound arts and technology is actually the, the most uh, recent program that we have here. It's it's uh, it has only around five six years, and it it uh, it was born with the will of exactly what we we were trying to say. The relevance of technology, the relevance of a contemporary uh, artistic creation and an artistic practice, and the needs of finding uh, a bridge, uh, organic bridge between performance, uh, composition, technology, improvisation, and so on. So, it, actually, it was a dream that we 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 were dreaming of for many years. Uh, of course, Portugal is within the Western uh, tradition, a bit, let's say, traditional in the, in the musical uh, field, let's say. It's changing rapidly, fortunately, I think. Um, but also this master comes to, to try to, to help and to, to facilitate a bridge between um, music and the contemporaneity of, of this, also the idea of a sound gesture. Not only the music as we traditionally conceive it, but also the sound as the raw material for creative production within an artistic field. So those subjects, I will not read it to you, but it's, it's, I think it's clear, it, it surpasses that the idea of this notion of giving very clear skills within the sound design, the audio, special, special audio, and of course, the creation lab is one of the important things. And uh, I will show you in a minute uh, one or two examples of our students' work, so you get a hint of what we have been doing here in the last five years within this master. I should just mention to finish my, my, my presentation and give more time to Bruno and, and Rui the next, uh, that uh, one of the... Um, Nice things that we have in our curriculum, being it so wide with so many uh, variants, is that um, each subject becomes an option uh, to the other variants. So even if it's not uh, a, a curricular unit that is in, our, in the curriculum, curriculum of a, a certain variant, it can, it can be an option. So uh, in this sense, each student can do its own curricula uh, uh, with so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, this is, we don't have time enough, but just to say that we are, we think this, as we, I was saying that we think about music and this contemporaneity of the concept of music and sound and all this fluidity that we, we find it more and more attractive. Uh, it's also, it's, it, it is facilitated a lot when we contact with other countries, with our um, partners within uh, mainly within uh, Europe, but also this interesting partnership with uh, with Cape Town in South Africa is very very interesting in this sense. So we are part active members of the the major associations, European associations in performing arts, uh, performing um, arts uh, like music and theatre, like the AEC, the ELIA, and the OA, mostly for opera and many international projects which i would just uh call your attention to the risono this is still an ongoing uh, project a joint master uh, together with uh, antwerp and vilnius in lithuania and we are developing which we will uh, apply to uh, rasmus mundus um, international joint master in collaborative music creation and performance this idea of a composer that also performs and the performer that composes again in trying to bridge these gaps that we somehow identify in a traditional way uh, of looking at uh, music um and the performer which is also a luthier which yeah. builds its own instrument right exactly well just to give you a brief uh, contextualization these are some of our spaces the studios the recording studios uh, then we have each uh, studio has somehow a, a different, uh, uh, let's say, assumption. Uh, this one is the B studio where we, that we use mo mostly for music production. The first one is to record and to to do uh, live recordings uh, on many uh, different uh, ensembles that we have also in school. This one is the C studio where we work with multi-channel and uh, special audio, Marco and uh, will probably also have something to say about this. Um, and then we have a mobile van where we do kind of outside uh, works uh, outside our campus. And this is uh, two photos of our theater, which is really relevant for our students also to get this connection with real and professional world. Well, as promised, and to finish uh, my presentation, Pedro's, um, just two brief uh, teasers of uh, works of um, students of, the, of this year, uh, of our Master in Sound Arts and Technology the, that were presented um, recently. Well, let's see if you... Well, very brief, just to have you also to understand that uh, we were speaking about uh, music and technology, but actually the sound arts, uh, tech, master in sound arts and, and technologies, we are willing and dreaming again, the dream word is, I think it's important, to, to, to this uh, collaborative work also with other disciplines, like the video images and, and, and uh, many other um, fields of artistic uh, work. This is another one that was made in cooperation with a museum in a beautiful place in Portugal. Uh, a lot of the field work here, field recordings, and also videos and conceptual uh, projections um, and it was made it started in one of our curricular units called uh, creation lab which is one of the most important things where we work creative processes and we try to 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 um, let's say to challenge the, the students to go a bit further to challenge the status quo also on the way of doing 
arts and music uh, in our our times. So thank you for listening, and I give the floor to Rui that will somehow continue this this thing. I will stop sharing the screen. Hi. Okay, so I'll I'll try to make it brief. There are a lot of things that Bruno and Pedro already covered, but uh, I am a composer first and foremost, and so as all composers, I will talk a bit about my work because we we tend to be um, self centered. I don't know, but um, so I'll share the screen. But mostly, what I'll try to bring is also a perspective on how do we bridge technology and tradition? And especially in the master in composition and in, in the teaching of composition, this is a very important thing. I'm sure we're all very much aware of the dangers of technology even. I, I, I suppose every electroacoustic music composer has been through a time where technology becomes so obsessive that you stop making music. You're just dealing with technology and dealing with the problems of technology. And uh, in the other sense, there are some students who just feel detached from technology. That they don't really want to go into technology. And this has interested me a lot in the last years, how to bridge these two things, how to solve this problem. So one of the perspectives most important for me is actually Martin Heidegger's perspective on technology from 1949. And of course, I'm not going to summarize this, this essay, but this in this question concerning technology, Heidegger looks for the for the essence of technology. And he says that the essence of technology is to make us look into the world as a collection of resources waiting to be optimized. And in this sense, technology makes us, uh, technology in this becomes no longer a tool for our ends, but we become tools to meet the ends of technology itself. So we become cogs uh, in, in this eternal progress, this idea of everything is all, always moving into, into more efficiency, being more optimized and being into more progress. I, I, this is a 70 something year old article that I think is still very much interesting and present. And if you mix this, one of the things that is very important about Heidegger is that he says, in order to stop this, in order to try to be immune to this, we need to deal with our skill. We need skills and the kind of skills that artists have, the kind of relationship with materials, the kind of relationship with the world that artists have been developing for centuries in all cultures. Now, obviously, he's focusing on European culture, but I don't think this is, this is just about European culture. The relationship with the world, I think it's actually more maintained outside of Europe than mostly inside of Europe. But another very important recent uh, theorist on this ideas is uh, Thor Magnusson and his marvelous book, Sonic Writing. One of the, the big ideas that he has is when you're developing tools, when you're developing in instruments, you're already composing because each instrument has in itself the roots of all the music that it will make. Each technology has the roots of whatever we will musically make out of it. So, so to go away with this idea that technology is neutral, uh, technology is not neutral, technology is never neutral. Um, and of course, and I'm pretty much, we are all familiar with this, when we use certain tools, for example, digital tools, some digital audio workstations will lead us to work in one direction or another. I think there's a, there's a, a willingness of the material um, that, that we need to be aware of. Another very important reference for me is Nicholas Collins. And in this fabulous interview in Tsunami, he says one very interesting thing for me. He says, you know, when I started studying composition, um, the whole European tradition, Beethoven, Bach, Mozart was, was a given. You know, you could like the art ensemble of Chicago, but you had to love Beethoven. That's, that's, that's a given. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, but there's this generation of avant-garde composers that say to you, well, you can make music that comes out of other things, not out of this old European tradition. Or they come out of scientific experiments. They come out of, of course, he's referring to Alvin Lussier, Gordon Mama, Robert Ashley, John Cage, uh, all those names that we know. But he says one very important thing, and this was very important. This blew open the idea of what music could be. But he says, for me, one very important thing. He says, when we look back, 
the music that has stood the test of time of these composers is the music of the composers who actually had a very strong sense of tradition. Mm. So it's good to do away with the tradition, but in the end, if you somehow bring the tradition back into it, yeah. it will give the best results. And so I'll give you just a few examples of in my work, how, how does this work? Uh, 10 years ago, uh, actually more than 10 years ago, I was developing tools for sound specialization and I was working uh, towards my PhD in sound specialization. And I developed some tools. I developed some pieces. One of them, you will listen to it later today, Pendulum, it's from this time. But I was dealing with sound specialization and the techniques of sound specialization. But of course, I had to read everything that you have to read about the techniques of sound specialization. But I found that what triggered me, what, what paved the, the way forward was actually going into architecture and reading and getting in touch with, uh, with what architects were doing because they know space in a way that musicians, um, you know, they, they know space in a different way. Of course, Bernhard Leitner, the, the Austrian architect that does sound works is an obvious reference, but one less obvious is Portuguese Baroque architecture. And actually, if you go into this convent uh, in Mafra, the basilica has six, not, not less than six tube organs displaced around the space. And there are actually a few pieces that were composed for the six organs. Uh, coming from the tradition of Gabrielli and the Cori Spezzati in Venice, um, but dealing with a very particular way of approaching this, yeah. this space that is unique in the world. And I went to the pieces of these composers, and I have to say that some of their ideas of dealing with space have been uh, overwhelming in terms of what I could do with musical space. Also, I had the experience of playing the gamelan. And one of the things about playing the gamelan is when you're playing, it's a very spatial music. Most of the times you don't talk about that, but it's, since it has very strong resonances, but very strong attacks, and mo lots of instruments with different chambers play playing the same notes, you get this very spatial kind of experience. And reading through music in Bali by Colin McPhee, the, the 1960s book that, that Colin McPhee published, a brilliant book that paved the way into minimal music in the States, etc. But reading this book, this book does not talk about space, but reading it through the idea of space actually brought a lot to me. And now what I'm doing is developing new interfaces for musical expression and new instruments. That's a, a big thing that interests me. And of course, I have to go to the, to the research in sound technology. I have to learn how to code these things. I have to you know, be able to understand the maths and lose myself in, in algorithms. But at the same time, for me at least, as a matter of discipline, I have to go through Baroque techniques of building instruments. Mm -hmm. Because when you're using a, a physical modeling algorithm, of course, the physical modeling algorithm, you read two or three papers, you go into the state of the art algorithm, mm -hmm. and it gives you an easy way to, to develop things. But yeah. you, if you listen to it with the same with the same kind of attitude that Baroque harpsichord makers would put into carving the wood, into selecting the wood, then you can actually, I think, learn a lot about that in terms of how you design the sound and the interaction into it. And this is, this is the instrument I'm currently building. It's very much still a work in progress. Uh, of course, it uses some built, some bought things like the instrument, which is a brilliant thing, and the Bella a board for low latency audio but first and foremost most importantly it uses a lot of renaissance and baroque inspired notions of timbre tuning and temperament and it's not about imitating baroque baroque timbres you can do that with sampling it's not about that yeah. it's about going into technology with baroque inspired tuning and temperament and timbre ears uh, which you get through listening to a lot of his music and playing a lot of his music, which is something I did in my past. Yeah. And so this was briefly my presentation on how do, at least my vision on how do we could bridge uh, tradition and technology in a degree like our master in composition, our PhD in, in, crea in artistic creation. Thank you. You have, a, um, up until this point, a standing ovation from Cape Town. So thank you so much for that. <clears throat> thank you.
shall we continue? Or would you like to open the floor for questions? As you see fit. I think Marco will introduce Nuno now, but I, I think if you have time for questions, I don't know. Do you... um, I would I think it's my... Okay. I think it, we should open the floor for some questions. Yes, I yes. I think, um, you know, uh, technology left, right and center, I do find it quite tricky to interact over, over a flat screen. It's not, it's not optimum, but um, uh, to begin with, um, I would like to say that it's the work overall, what you represent as an institution and the individuals, um, is extremely interesting to us, but it's, it is very, very beautiful. And the way in which uh, you manage to integrate um, different uh, aspects of sound making, sound generation, um, is, is very special. Uh, you are also the first institution that I'm aware of that has a mobile studio. I've not seen that before. Um, so that is such an important tool. If I think of our own context down here, um, you know, to get out and to, to, work, to work in the field for, for field work purposes, um, this is relatively rarely done and to have a fully equipped, to have the infrastructure available to do that is, is really um, extremely interesting. I have a very mundane uh, first question. Um, in terms of the PhD in, um, if I understand correctly, applied research, um, is there a framework within the European Union that determines how such or what such a degree should con consist of, how, how, how it works? Because we down here uh, also are attempting to pursue a, a practical doctoral degree. Um, so is there, does there exist a, a framework that determines how such a qualification is put together? I think I can answer that. Um, the thing is, OE, OECD, the, 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 the very the, the infamous Frascati manual that defines what is or isn't research, uh, is very much a force in, in Europe uh, and in European institutions. Yeah. And the Frascati manual explicitly excludes artistic creation as a knowledge creation thing. Uh -huh. Uh, so, in terms of a European framework, this is the most important thing, actually. And we, we in, in every European country, we have people dealing with this and battling this. Uh, some of the institutions that Bruno mentioned, AEC, ELIA, are very active mm -hmm. in terms of lobbying within the European Union to actually revise the Frascati manual and include the recent movements of artistic research. Yeah. So, that, that I would say that most of, of European society at large does not understand the importance of practice research, of artistic research, and in fact, work kind of works against it. Again, yeah. But, but, I, but I'm, I'm very confident uh, now because the, the relevant um, artistic institutions that bind together the, the, the several uh, institutions like Ejmai in Europe are all joining forces to actually make this work. And I'm very pleased to say that this is the first PhD, ours is the first PhD in Portugal yeah. that places the, 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 the stronger emphasis on artistic creation actually as the, the means of knowledge production. Right, right. Um, fascinating. Um, are there questions from our floor? Any questions from here? Uh, may I pose one more question? Uh, we need not spend, spend much time on it. Um, however, <clears throat> in terms uh, uh, of your instrument building activities, instrument making activities, um, how do you engage? Uh, ca can you sketch a little bit more about the sense of Baroque sensitivity with which, for example, you've approached um, uh, building into creating new musical instruments w what does that consist of that sensitivity th th uh, uh, towards a tradition that you would like now to transplant or to engage with from a technological uh, contemporary perspective it's funny it's funny because i don't know if i can explain it very well but i'll try the thing is when you work with sound technology it's very easy to get you know this is the sound you want uh, and you envision a sound yeah. and very easy to get there. You know, you just go and use the appropriate techniques. If you know the techniques, you will be able to get the sound that you want. Yes. But the beauty of, the, of it is the constraints. Because, for example, 
in in Baroque, I would say in Renaissance times, at least for what I've heard, this idea of eliminating the beatings and actually going into these very perfect thirds and before that the perfect fifth, the perfect yes. fourth, without any beatings, uh, that was a goal. That's a very easy to to attain goal in electronic music. You can get sound, you can get you know perfectly tuned sinusoids with no beatings, mm -hmm. but that's very boring. The most interesting thing of the, of the, in the Renaissance and Baroque, if I can give just this brief example, is you want to get there, but you cannot. <laughs> and since you cannot, you actually get into a lot of very interesting things because you have to use your ears. Yeah. You're you're achieving an impossible goal. And I, I think one of the dangers of technology is to make us to make it seem to us that there are no impossible goals. Mm. And we need impossible goals actually, because the compromises, having limitations and having to compromise, I think is what makes an artistic uh, experiment interesting. Thank you, thank you. It's most most insightful.